In this shiny new electrified future, will the grid be able to cope? Well, we're here to answer that question. I am 35 metres underneath London. That is part of the national grid. And this is the Fully Charged Show. Like the Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia on March the 11th and 12th. So this is our control room. This is where we operate and have eyes on all of our 350 substations, 4,500 miles of pylons, 900 miles of cable. From here, we look after it all. We know what's happening in Newcastle, we know what's happening in London, and I can also see down to Cornwall all at once with everyone in this room. And just describe to me the different, like where, so, so the things you control in this room, they don't, that doesn't go all the way to a house, right? So that's correct. So in this room, we will look after it from the point of view it enters our network at 400,000 volts. We will transport it down those highways and we'll take it to one of those 350 substations and at that point, we will hand it diligently over to our colleagues in the distribution networks and they'll transport it from 132,000 volts right down to 230 volts in all of our houses and homes and make sure that our lights and electricity is available for us all to use. This new electrified world that we're looking at where people want more electricity to do all these new things and to do it with more renewable energy, how, how does that change the grid? So things like vehicle to grid and all of the smart networks that need to be created to support it, they will change what we need to do in this room. So what it means is we need to build our networks, not just thinking about how we build more stuff, but how we operate the network much more intelligently. And actually, we don't just take advantage of generation going all the way to demand. We start to work with demand customers so that they can play an active part in the market and also on the network so that we can take advantage of them coming onto the grid. So what sort of things is National Grid doing to prepare for this electrified future? So National Grid's preparing really in three fronts. We're looking to connect more green sources of energy. We're looking to create significant more capacity in our network because demand will increase. And today, 17 exciting new projects have been announced that National Grid will go on and build those and that will facilitate those demand. We're also thinking about our own assets and how we build more intelligent assets so that we can utilise the grid in a much better way so that we can help move towards net zero as a network. In this room, our job is to keep the lights on. So that's all the theory of how the system could or should work. But when it comes down to it, this is what it means. This is where people live. Normal houses on a normal street and people down here are plugging in computers and kettles and toasters all the time, on and off, plugging into this network. But there's something behind that. There's something invisible. And here, it's underneath our feet. So let's have a look at what's going on down there. So London Power Tunnels has been created to um, replace the existing infrastructure which has buried cables across South London but also to meet future demand so we can't have electric vehicles without these tunnels, we can't facilitate future residential developments without these tunnels. So the cables are replacing existing circuits but also being upgraded to facilitate future demand. So the tunnel where we're located now is around 35 metres deep. If we moved to Hurst in our um, Bexley area of the tunnel, we would be up to 62 metres deep. Essentially, we've created a huge duct to carry cables, but also we'll have the ability to cycle down these tunnels, perform operational checks, maintenance, and facilitate um, future cables. These cables are shifting electricity at 400 kilovolts, which is great for efficiently getting electricity long distances. It's no good for your home. So up there, there is what's called a substation, and the job of the substation is to step down the voltage so it can actually be used in domestic appliances. So this bit here, it looks like a bit of a wiggle, and it is. These are deliberate uh, bends in the wire so that as it firmly contracts and expands as the temperature changes, 
basically the wire doesn't fall off the rack. They've thought about this. It's really done from a disruption perspective, so how can we have the minimal amount of impact on our local communities? But also if you consider land arrangements and planning, it's really complex to be able to dig up large sections of, of road, whereas here we're so far below ground that our consenting arrangement is much simpler. So that one is the tunnel to North London, which has been operating for a few years. And this one is the one that's under construction that is going to go through all of South London. We completed London Power Tunnels 1, which went from Hackney down here to Wimbledon. London Power Tunnels 2 is essentially the, the South Ring and it will allow us to transport energy exactly as you say. Once you've got some wires, you need electricity to go in them. And this is the North Sea coast up near Newcastle. It's such a lovely day. And the reason I'm here is that sometimes our electricity comes from a surprisingly long distance away, right out across the sea over there. And to get it here, what you need is something called an interconnector, a junction box that can let us exchange electricity with Norway. This is the top of the Blythe Converter Station. And what happens here is really exciting. The North Sea is just over there and there is a cable 720 kilometers long that connects us to Norway. So electricity can come in from there along two cables, comes into this room right underneath me, which is the DC hall. Um, and that's just over 500 kilovolts. These are huge numbers. Uh, and that passes into the valve hall just down there, which converts it to an AC signal the reactor hall, which smooths out the signal, and then finally the AC hall is over there, and that is where it gets sent out to the rest of the country into the national grid. And the amount of power that can come through here is huge, so that maximum capacity, this can transfer 1,400 megawatts of energy. It is a lot. So effectively in this hall, this is where the, the, the change basically, the, the conversion happens from DC to AC. Interconnectors themselves are effectively like superhighways for clean energy. So uh, for North Sea Link, it's transmitting energy from Norway, from a converter station in Kvildal, um, uh, uh, end of the North Sea across to the substation where we are today in Blyth. Um, and effectively, it's allowing that transfer of excess energy to an area where energy is required. And that can flip back and forth depending on basically the you know the supply and demand of the different countries. For Norway um, there's a lot of hydropower there so a lot of um, clean green energy um, and then for the UK in terms of the interest from Norway we've got a lot of wind power um, and so the interconnector allows us to actually um, have flexibility um, within the energy supply and be able to um, balance um, the, the demand and the supply across both countries. So the interconnector itself is, is a bit like a sort of electrical seesaw that if there's more on one side it will flow that way but then it can switch around and if there's more on the other side it can flow back so it can actually flow in both directions yeah yeah that's correct and that can happen pretty quickly um, and throughout the day depending again on you know the market conditions what I really love about being here is that it's a physical thing you can see that there is metal and plastic and that electricity isn't just this magic it's a it's a physical part of the world and there is this grid of metal that connects our country together and this is what runs our country and this is what makes it happen isn't it great from Norway, um, the high voltage cable um, uh, traverses across the North Sea uh, as a high voltage direct current. Uh, when it gets to Blyth um, and to the converter station, it then um, changes into AC to be able to connect into the electricity grid system in the UK. The DC system, the direct current, is actually a lot more efficient over long distances. You get very, very minimal losses. Um, but when obviously it connects into land, it must then change into AC to be able to connect into the grid. 
grid system. And just paint a picture of the physicality, because we've got, I mean, we're talking about, you know, sort of big cables, but fundamentally it's just metal, right? It's just copper. So this is actually a sample of the cable that runs underneath the, uh, the sea and connects into the converter station here at Blythe. Um, effectively, you have the conductor in the centre, and that's surrounded by layers of insulation, and all of this is armour and protection. So it basically just protects the, uh, the cable. In terms of the capacity, um, uh, it's up to 1400 um, megawatts, so we can run that either way, exporting or importing between here and, and Norway. With renewables compared to uh, power stations, you have a lot more variability and you can't just turn off the wind. So the interconnector provides that means of being able to um, transport that excess energy and then provides benefits from a consumer perspective in terms of energy prices as well. It's really exciting just knowing kind of how, th how the project itself is, is bene benefiting society. And, and helping that transition towards net zero ultimately. Um, it's supporting the UK energy system to transition to more and more renewable energy sources. And it's really exciting to be part of that, just from a construction project perspective, but then also knowing the wider benefits that you have in is absolutely amazing. It's been great to have a look around here. And what I like most about it is this making the invisible visible. Like every time we plug something into a wall, we are plugging into this system that we never see, but it's always there. And really the big question, you know, it's exciting to see it, but the big question and the one we get asked all the time is can the grid cope with an electrified world? And I think if you look at not just the organization they've got here, but the plans they've got for the future, this is what is gonna give it the capability to cope. We're gonna watch this story unfold. It's gonna be exciting, but the electrified world is on its way.